All right, let's start where the president didn't, which is facts um, and data. Across the United States, we now have 80,000 total cases. Um, most of the world, more than 1,100 of those people, they have died. As you can see from this chart, the number of cases nationwide going up exponentially. Globally, more than half of a million people have been infected. 24,000 of them have died. New York has by far the most cases in the country, but many other states, they are on the same trajectory as the Empire State. These charts, they show how cases are growing in other states compared to New York, which is the gray line. Now, as you can see here, let's bring up that chart, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, they're all on similar paths. The same deal as well with Michigan, Florida, and Texas. Dozens of other states, they're in the same boat, but let's not inundate you with too many charts. Let's put a human face on this. New York City hospitals, they are already getting overrun, and so are facilities in many other areas. We are past the hypothetical stage, folks. I want to start with the Big Apple and particularly hone in on Elmhurst Hospital, which is in the borough of Queens. As you can see, people. They are lining up and down the street just to get in. And now an emergency room doctor at Elmhurst providing a rare inside look at what it's like inside her ER. We now have these five vents. We probably, you know, unless people die, I, I suspect we'll be back to needing to beg for ventilators again in another day or two. There's a mythical hundred vents out there, which we haven't seen. leaders in various offices from the president to the head of health and hospitals saying things like we're going to be fine everything's fine and from our perspective everything is not fine i don't have the support that i need and even just the materials that i need physically to take care of my patients and it's it's America, and we're supposed to be a first world country. On a regular day, my emergency department's volume is pretty high. It's about 200 people a day. Now we're seeing 400 or more people a day. The Wall Street Journal provides additional details. Quote, hospitals have passed a tipping point as a relentless climb in infections for some to move patients to outlying facilities, hospitals in parts of New York City have become so full of critically ill patients that they have steered ambulances elsewhere. The full to capacity morgue at Elmhurst Hospital in Queens is now using a refrigerated truck to hold some of the dead. 13 people died in the hospital in a 24-hour window. Many doctors, they are speaking out. And again, I'll use their words, quote, we need space and beds. This is a war. I'm going into war and trying not to get killed. Another, it's just like a tidal wave. I know actual true horrors are coming. And you should know the worst, by all projections, is definitely to come. We go to Mount Sinai West in Manhattan, and a nurse, she's just died from the virus. Other nurses resorted to wearing garbage bags. Things are looking so bad that hospitals in several areas, including D.C., Illinois, the Carolinas, Pennsylvania, and more, they're discussing do not resuscitate policies for infected patients, regardless of the wishes of the families. And even though New York is ahead of the curve here, and not in a good way, hospitals across the country, they're already struggling with patient demand. More than 150 workers at Boston hospitals, they've tested positive for COVID-19, and many facilities there are running short on essential supplies. Michigan hospitals are also at or near capacity. Same goes in Louisiana, where the number of cases are rising and rising rapidly. Governor Edwards there saying the hospitals could be overwhelmed by the end of next week. Governor Tom Wolf of Pennsylvania saying much the same thing. And in Atlanta, Georgia, it is already happening. All of that city's major hospitals have already filled every single ICU bed and supplies, again, running low. 
I want to bring in our first guest tonight, Dr. Amir Al-Din. He is the Chief Medical Officer at U.S. Acute Care Solutions, and he brings a fascinating perspective. He represents 3,000 ER doctors across this country seeing patients in 20 states. Doctor, you have a unique perspective. You represent, uh, as I understand, as many as 3,000 ER doctors, so you really get the perspective here, um, not just from one particular area, but really a national uh, perspective. And while it's not a one-size-fits-all, the stories that we're hearing from Elmsford, is it fair to say that ER doctors coast-to-coast -coast are concerned that New York could be their future? Yes, absolutely. Um, the the coast-to-coast -coast concern uh, is is definitely present. New York, of course, represents the epicenter. It's um, obviously densely populated, and they are seeing the worst of this right now. But uh, no major city, uh, I think, is safe, and uh, we're we're just hoping that our social distancing practices um, happen in time and with enough effectiveness that this um, you know tide, rising tide of of critically ill patients, doesn't come all at once. And that's the major concern. If we could if we could find a way to flatten the curve nationally, uh, then we could actually slow down the, the pace of these patients and not run out of ventilators, as you heard earlier, uh, and personal protective equipment. Doctor, um, I've been having a regular conversation with um, an emergency room doctor in the northern portion of Italy, which obviously, as we know, um, has suffered devastating consequences from COVID. And it is eerily familiar, my conversation two weeks ago, in Italy to what I'm hearing now. And maybe the most frightening uh, metric is, and you know this, New York City has some of the greatest world-class hospitals um, in any uh, city. And while it may be first, it'll be uh, hard to argue that they're not as prepared as any major city for what is coming. The idea that they're two to three weeks from the apex of this, uh, that is a chilling, thought, isn't it? Yeah, it's very worrisome. I'm, I'm very much uh, have great empathy and, and sympathy for my colleagues there, all the patients there. Uh, I can I can only imagine. And I hope that we're learning um, from from New York's experience. It's a terrible, terrible lesson to learn this way. Um, but we really need to be good about um, separating and slowing the tide. I want to put a human face um, on the people on the front lines, the doctors, the RNs, and as I said before, um, you're the perfect guy to talk to uh, because 3,000 ER doctors, um, you, I can only imagine, not putting names or even hospitals to it, some of the conversations you've had, but the conversations from the folks within the walls of Elmhurst, I mean, you have OBs, you have radiologists who are now in the ER wards, uh, you have people saying, you know, I'm afraid to go home. People going home with their emergency shields on because they're afraid of bringing what's inside the hospital home. So many afraid for their own safeties, what's going on. My question is, I know a lot of people heroically are coming out of retirement to come work, but even if you do the math, they're the most susceptible populations because they're in many cases seniors. Is the cavalry coming? Uh, in, forget even the supplies. Let's talk the human beings for a moment. I, they have every right to be worried, but are they also worried they're going into a war not properly armed? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, I think that maintenance of proper PPE, so personal protective equipment, is essential to keep uh, our healthcare workers um, working as their specialty has trained them to. Um, we are also, in our in our group, we have 3,000 physicians, PAs, NPs in several different specialties, including emergency medicine, ICU, um, and hospital medicine. But we are also, uh, you know, keeping our, our uh, minds open to the possibility that we're going to have to recruit uh, from a number of different specialties and try to train them them in order to uh, take care of patients should the time come. In fact, I just uh, discussed a, a, uh, a briefing, uh, internal briefing on um, how we would orient a non-emergency physician provider uh, to an emergency department if, if that happened. So um, we're trying to prepare, but as long as we get the personal protective equipment on the hospital side, on the, on the uh, nursing, but also on the physician PA and P side, we can at least slow this down and, and not lose so many folks to illness. Take us into the ER, doctor. Um, uh, one of the, uh, uh, and this is uh, unavoidable, but given the infections, 
these people in need of ventilation, A, some, in many cases, they're waiting there, but they're alone. Uh, family members can't be with them. The doctors are overwhelmed, and while some may try to get a family member on when they see the final moments of a patient maybe nearing here, we're hearing the patients are discovered dead in beds here because the patients have to care to those that have the best chance. Describe the state of affairs, and people are talking openly, as I mentioned in the introduction to you, about maybe needing to perform triage, like it's a real wartime situation, how best to use a ventilator for a person who has the best chance for survival. What are some of the decisions and some of the real-time dilemmas facing these frontline care providers that COVID is imposing? Yes, these are very difficult ethical dilemmas. Um, you know, I've been talking to experts around the country about this, not just within my group, but outside of my group. And the the ethical position that this is placing us under violates many of the oaths that we've taken as physicians. Um, I can't I can't really tell you how powerful this is and how painful this is to think about um, when we when we talk about allocation of resources, life saving resources. Um, I'm sure Italy has had to have these very similar uh, conversations. It's very difficult, and the probably the only way to, to go forward is to actually talk about these things ahead of time so that when the time comes, you're not making hasty decisions. Um, but, you know, I've thought very hard about this, and, and, and these decisions, either way you go, uh, pain is there. Doctor, um, again, I, I'm, I'm imagining you've had this conversation with uh, uh, other ER docs who say, hey, um, Pretty soon, they're not going to have equipment for me. I may already be in that situation. Uh, going back to my conversation um, with the doctor on the front lines in Italy, there weren't masks. They went in unmasked into ERs. Are doctors going to be willing and nurses to take those personal chances because the supplies don't meet the demand and they're going to have to go literally into care knowing that they could be not only exposed, but as I understand it, you've forgotten more than I'll ever know, given the proximity and the density of sick patients, they're particularly vulnerable here. Are they gonna be willing to make those sacrifices if they're not already? Um, it's a great question. I can't speak for all the physicians. Um, you know, although I do you know, represent thousands of them, those are very difficult conversations to have and, and very difficult decisions to make. Um, I do have faith that this call for to action, to manufacturing, um, to our, our government and, and our manufacturers, I do have faith that we will start to produce the equipment that we need. We just need to get this out there, get it distributed. Um, the, the, all those those millions of, of N95 masks that we've heard about, they need to get get there. And it's time because we have the ability to take care of um, these patients. We just need the right equipment to do so. And um, I'm, I'm calling on all the manufacturing to really um, push this forward. This is this is the real deal. I'll say this in closing. Um, uh, unfortunately, I remembered all too well um, nearly 20 years ago during 9-11. It, it, it took that horrible day for the full appreciation for our first responders and what they went through. And I think right now, uh, I speak um, uh, with family um, in medicine that the heroes, not just the doctors, but the nurses, but everybody working in these hospitals, um, not just today, but in the weeks and months to come, uh, it is overdue the appreciation uh, for what they're going through and the oath they swore. But uh, doctor, thank you very much. And I mean it when I say stay safe and uh, be well. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. All right. When we come back, the very latest on $2 trillion in stimulus uh, spending that is slated for passage in the bill on Capitol Hill and whether or not Congress will get it done before this week and also near congressman who will be voting tomorrow. He'll join us after the break to discuss the impacts even on his home state.